only a little over 100 years ago, we fly, were the Wright, Wright brothers flying their plane uh, for the very first time. A, a little bit over 50 years later, we landed a man on the moon. And now we're having commercial space flight with rockets uh, that are made by private companies that can, that with boosters that can now land upright. Right? And we can reuse them. It's hard to argue that in the thousands of years of humanity, it's not on this exponential curve. ChatGPT wasn't a thing several years ago, wasn't a viable product that now you're seeing, uh, uh, even last year, AI to video is terrible. And now I'm scrolling my Twitter feed and I'm seeing direct to consumer brands making uh, AI videos based on image prompts that they can then go, they're, they're good enough to go and use as ads. The deficits are meant to be a temporary jumpstart. But we've been running a perpetual fiscal deficit since 2002. That was the last time that we ran a fiscal surplus. Uh, so uh, as a percent of GDP, it's getting wider and wider and wider. And so I created a year over year chart of this. So this is the metric that we created. This podcast is entertainment, not financial tax or legal advice. Views expressed represent statements of the speaker in their individual capacity, do not represent the views of Unchained, and should not be considered investment advice. Speakers often have personal family or business connections to Unchained, which may include direct financial benefits. Please see our disclosure at unchained.com slash podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Frontier podcast. This week, I have, we have on Joe Consorti. Joe, welcome. Thanks a lot for having me, Joe. This should be fun. Absolutely. So, Joe, let's kind of just jump right into it. What's happening in markets right now? Like we have the U.S. government running trillion dollar deficits. Lynn Alden keeps saying this train has no brakes. What's going on from your perspective? It's an interesting situation. The way that I'd summarize it is that everything is accelerating. So Bitcoin is too. Uh, and we're talking over multi-month, multi-year time horizons, maybe not in current price action. Like if we're looking at daily resolutions, obviously Bitcoin's down. You know, obviously Bitcoin does its thing over a multi-month, multi-year time horizon. And so too does the fiscal and monetary cycle churn on those uh, time horizons as well. So right now we're in a spot where the fiscal situation is pretty bad. It's very bad. And that's not to say that the U.S. government can't fund itself. There are plenty of buyers for U.S. Treasury debt. Otherwise, you know, the Fed would be monetizing more of it. Um, currently, the U U.S. Treasury is issuing something like uh, something on the order of like three hundred million dollars uh, worth of net treasuries every single month. So as they roll over, the U.S. Treasury uh, on net is issuing anywhere between one hundred and three hundred million dollars worth. And um, the main issue with that is the interest expense. So the interest expense right now is on track to hit one point six trillion dollars a year. For context, historically, it has been around $300 billion, if not less. Uh, but the Fed has obviously been in this rate hiking cycle. It's raised interest rates. Um, and in doing so, it's raised interest rates in the U.S. Treasury market. So what the U.S. Treasury has to borrow at. So the U.S. Treasury has this $25 trillion market of revolving debt it has to issue in order to fund itself. Taxes are one way that it funds itself. Debt instruments in the U.S. Treasury market are another way that it does it. And so, you know, if you had a credit card uh, outstanding and then all of a sudden your interest rate went from 15% to 70%, uh, it'd be much more difficult for you to fund yourself. And chances are a strategy that you would probably consider is taking on another credit card in order to pay down that credit card. That's kind of where we are as a country. Um, the interest expense is now $140.23 billion a month. That's up from the average of just three years ago of about uh, $300 uh, billion a month. Uh, excuse me, three three hundred. Um, uh, excuse me, uh, thirty billion rather, thirty billion dollars a month, uh, which is like a one point six trillion dollar a year pace, uh, and it's getting worse. So there's a little bit of breathing room because the uh, rates are now coming back down. The Fed announced a rate cut that's on the way, and so the U.S. Treasury market uh, yields are now coming back down. I believe tens over the last month have fallen something like, uh, well, well, they've fallen something like hundred forty basis points. Twos have fallen something like hundred forty basis points as well. But uh, the reality is, uh, all of this debt now in the system, um, we have to continue issuing it at this elevated rate in order to maintain the same level of economic output. Um, so as a country, unless we want to plunge ourselves into, ourselves into a recession, we have to keep issuing this debt. The marginal buyer of that debt um, is going to continue being banks, which means that their balance sheets are going to continue expanding, uh, which means they can do more lending, which means asset prices will go up in the long run. People look at heightened debt issuance and U.S. Treasury market in a bull, bull run, and the first order effect is the money to buy those treasuries is going to come from other assets. But the reality here is 
a lot of those treasuries get absorbed by banks. And let's say if 50% of those treasuries get absorbed by banks, they get levered up. That means more balance sheet capacity. That means they can do more lending. And guess where the money inevitably flows? Bitcoin and other assets. And so really, you know, Lynn's right in that like nothing stops this train. Obviously, there are cycles where rates come back down, the interest expense comes back down, things will cool off for a while. But we are in a debt-fueled global economy. And here in the United States, it's no different. Uh, So the debt issuance will continue staying very elevated. Um, We'll continue needing uh, more and more and more of it to maintain the same level of economic output. At the individual level, that means life gets harder. But if you own asset prices, that means you're the beneficiary of all of that. So that is a very high level overview of kind of what's going on on the, you know, uh, several months, several year time frame. And right now, uh, you know, markets are bracing for a rate cut. Labor Day is around the corner. Uh, you know, all things considered, we should be in for after these several week, if not months period of really choppiness, we should be in for a, a pretty big bull market continuation, in my view, as the Fed is set to cut rates, as managers return from their desks next month, um, and as they start bidding risk. Yeah, I like that a lot. What are your thoughts like overall from like a macro perspective of I've seen commentators talk about the idea that, you know, or at least like you kind of learn in economics at school that you should be the government should be running like deficits when the economy is contracting, we're in a recession, blah, blah, blah. But over the last, you know, a couple of years, the economy has been early, like decades, like we've, we've kind of been running massive physical deficits for a very long time. And 2021 was like, pretty prime example of that like we were running you know trillion dollar deficits or close to it yet we were in a boom period like game stock was mooning bitcoin was going up like everything was kind of going up at the same time how does this end like do we just keep spending more and more money forever and ever and eventually the dollar just loses its reserve currency status or how do you think about that that's a great question so there are two ways out of the debt situation we're currently facing one is austerity which is let's issue less debt and spend less as a country, but no politician ever got elected on the platform of spending less money for their constituents. And the other option is just business as usual. Continue issuing as much debt as we are to spend as much on as many programs as we can. Um, and then the lives of individual Americans get worse and worse and worse. Um, and as Lynn said, to quote her, this train has no brakes. Asset prices, at the end of the day, Bitcoin in particular become the release valve for that. But you're right, we, you know, in economics, you're taught that uh, during market down, during economic downturns, running a deficit is actually a good thing because it's the um, public sector picking up the slack of the private sector. It's the government picking up the slack um, of businesses that are now throwing people out of work, um, that's now generating unemployment. And so a lot of the spending that gets sloshed around during an expansion phase of the economy isn't happening anymore. So what a deficit can do is if you're spending more money than you're making, if the government is printing money, um, the, uh, the, if the U.S. Treasury is issuing a whole lot of money, the government, uh, the Federal Reserve rather, is buying that, and therefore, thereby generating new money uh, where there was none before, then what you are doing is uh, you're spending money, money into the economy in place of the private sector that's kind of slowed down its spending. And so it's meant to be like a jumpstart. Deficits are meant to be a temporary jumpstart. But we've been running a perpetual fiscal deficit since 2002. That was the last time that we ran a fiscal surplus. Uh, so. Uh, As a percent of GDP, it's getting wider and wider and wider. And so not just looking at the absolute level of the deficit. Right now, we're running a $1.5 trillion deficit, despite us being in an asset price bull market, unemployment being relatively low. We shouldn't be running one, but we are. Um, And so over the last two decades, over the last uh, 22 years since 2002, that percentage of GDP has actually uh, increased. So the deficit as a percentage of our economic output has increased, which means the government spending is now no longer a measure that happens when the economy is in a downturn. Now it's a mainstay of our economic health. Uh, Our economic health would not be where it is, as measured by GDP, if the government didn't spend as much as it did. And so now we're in a situation where the problem is so big, the, the economy is so reliant on the treasury issuing all this debt, the Fed buying up more and more of it every single time, that if we stopped doing, if we pivoted to austerity, we would be in for a multi-year, uh, potentially decade plus long recession. And I know that no policymaker is going to do that because by the time that the next uh, election cycle rolls around, they'll get voted out. Um, I know that a president would never run on that platform because they wouldn't get elected. And so really, at the end of the day, it comes down to the individual. How are you going to protect yourself? And the answer to all of this, uh, the accelerating uh, debt problem that we're facing, and then the monetary problem on the other side of it, 
uh, where the Fed becomes complicit in this is to buy hard assets. Obviously, the traditional hard asset has been gold, but I think you do a great job at educating people about Bitcoin. I try to do my part as well, uh, getting more people onto this ship. Uh, because from a debt standpoint, this is untenable. Um, at the individual level, your life is going to continue getting worse. And these people are going to get elected regardless. Um, so you need to buy and hold on to hard assets for dear life. And so that's my view. Uh, no politician, no policymaker would ever pivot toward austerity because it would mean they wouldn't get reelected. Uh, we'd plunge ourselves into a multi-year recession. And the Treasury and the Federal Reserve would never allow a multi-year recession to happen. Uh, and so that's kind of my view about the long-term uh, playbook for this stuff. And then at the individual level, how you can play it, how you can insulate yourself from all. At what point, or maybe it's already occurred, do you think like the liquidity spigot is going to really open? Like, does something bad have to happen first for the Fed to cut rates and assets to go up, or could the liquidity spigot just kind of open and their and assets just melt up as the Fed starts lowering rates? So the liquidity spigot uh, has already opened. Um, there is a metric that we created at TBL at the Bitcoin layer called TBL liquidity. And it is essentially uh, all of the majority of major central bank balance sheets added up. And so I created a year over year chart of this. So this is the metric that we created. And as you'll see in the bottom left corner, um, this actually adds together the Fed's balance sheet, the ECB's balance sheet, China and Japan. Right? So these big, major developed market economies, um, balance sheets, all added together. Um, and basically, this is what we call liquidity, balance sheet capacity. And so you'll notice that in 2022, when Bitcoin was in its bear market, uh, the year-over-year -year change in global central bank balance sheets was actually negative. It's in the top pane in purple. And you'll see that it started rising right around the same time uh, that Bitcoin was rising too. And so the really beautiful thing about Bitcoin as an asset is it's like this sponge. It is the uh, kind of release valve for macro liquidity. When we're in a regime where liquidity is expanding um, or moving out of negative territory into positive territory, Bitcoin becomes a huge beneficiary, beneficiary of that. You'll notice that on a year-on-year -year basis, the moment that uh, these global central banks' uh, balance sheet moved into expansion, uh, almost to the week, actually, Bitcoin entered into a year-on-year -year expansion as well. So it flipped out of its bear market formally on this year-on-year -year basis into a bull market. So global central banks' balance sheets, if we add up not just what's happening in the US, because obviously the Fed has been reducing its balance sheet, if we add up all the other ones together, um, then actually liquidity has been in expansion territory for about uh, a little bit over a year now. And so Bitcoin has been the beneficiary of, beneficiary of all of that. So then it becomes a question of, okay, what, what, if there, what if a crisis was to occur? What if something was to occur that would kick this off into high gear and cause the Fed to start printing money as, it's, you know, as we you know, understand it? Uh, right now, the economy is chugging right along. There are some slowdown, pockets of slowdowns here and there. Um, uh, like in ISM services, for example, we're starting to see, starting to see slowdowns in employment uh, and things of that nature. The unemployment rate, of course, has now risen 90 basis points off of its low. For context, the Fed usually starts cutting rates when the unemployment rate rises about uh, 0.1 or 0.2% off its low. The Fed hasn't started cutting rates yet, and we're almost a full percentage point off of the unemployment rates low. And so people are thinking the Fed might be too late to the party. I personally don't think so because we let off this huge monetary bazooka in 2020 and 2021. So what we're, you know, what the unemployment rate is doing now is kind of just going back up to where it normally is, if not a little bit elevated. So the Fed has got some leeway. If a crisis were to occur, we're at a five and a half percent policy rate now. They have room to cut all the way down to zero right? If they want to, they have 550 basis points worth of room to cut to zero. They don't cut to zero. Uh, they cut to like a 0.25 basis, 0.25% uh, or 25 basis point upper bound. But if a crisis were to occur, if I'm wrong and a recession's right around the corner, which I could be, um, then the Fed would have not only the room to act and fix that, but also uh, we've seen how quickly they can do it. You were monitoring the Silicon Valley bank explosion. I was monitoring it as well. We know how quickly that happened in March of 2023. The Fed was extremely quick to respond. They responded overnight with the creation of the bank term funding program, their brand new facility. And so, you know, in that event, asset prices, um, you know, will go up, right? The Fed is very supportive to markets. Jerome Powell has said time and time and again that they're going to be data dependent. Um, he has made it very clear that if something were to occur, the Fed would be quick to act, not just with his words, but with his actions, with what he did with BTFP. 
And so the Fed has plenty of room to cut if things go south. Asset prices are already at or near all-time highs. And so I think that not only is the Fed put there um, underneath markets, but it's there underneath the economy too. And so I think now, rather than being a doomer, when it's most fashionable to be a doomer, I understand that there are risks at play, but the Fed can act overnight, and they have. And so betting on a prolonged recession, in my view, is a losing game. Um, and so with Labor Day coming up, traders coming back to their desks, uh, you know, from the Hamptons to probably go and bid up risk assets, given that the economy, like growth is moderating, but it's not, it's not contracting. We're not in negative territory. GDP forecasts are still positive. The employment picture is worsening, um, but mostly the story is disinflation and moderating growth. So I don't view a recession imminently around the corner, but if a black swan event were to occur, like a Silicon Valley Bank type March 2023 explosion, I know uh, that you know, given past behavior, the Fed will be very quick to act. So liquidity is already, to go back to the original question, liquidity is already expanding um, based on our models over at the Bitcoin layer. Uh, which are based off of uh, Michael Howell's models over at Cross Border Capital, who's kind of the czar of global liquidity. They're already expanding, so that's why asset prices are doing as well as they are. Plenty of balance sheet capacity to go around. Financial conditions are very loose. Um, but uh, if something were to occur, that would make financial conditions tighten up. Banks stop lending. Liquidity really, really shrivel. I know that the Fed would work overnight uh, to, to fix that because the other mandate that the Fed has, and I'll stop here in a second because I'm going on a bit of a rant, uh, is the no recession mandate, which is kind of, um, it's not something that, that's advertised by the Fed. The mandate from the Fed is twofold. It is uh, stable prices and full employment. But the other thing that they have not allowed since 2008 is a prolonged recession. Uh, we saw how quick they were to act uh, in 2020 uh, and in March of 2023 to prevent a similar thing from occurring. Uh, I can almost guarantee, right, I put my name on the line saying that the Fed will move heaven and earth as much as they can do to not allow a prolonged recession to occur, even if it means uh, that the lives of everyday Americans are worsened by it because of the money printing that will result. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I tend to agree with pretty much everything that, that you just mentioned. Um, this may be like a simplistic way to think about what, what might happen over the next few months or 12 months or so. But when, when rates drop, like it feels like a lot of people are like sitting on like their high yield savings account or T bills or their money market fund and they're earning that four to five percent that that's very comfortable to them. Um, and and if all of a sudden if rates start to drop significantly, then people are going to be like, oh gosh, like I need to deploy this cash into high quality semi scarce assets. What can I buy? I and mean, it feels like there's going to be a rush of capital, or at least I want to hear what you think. There might be a rush of capital out out into real estate, Bitcoin, stocks, whatever. And then at the same time, like looking at real estate prices in general, it's like take on a mortgage right now, your payment is going to be super high. But if rates come back down, you know, two to 3% or, or more, then all of a sudden it makes people, people might be like, oh, now I can deploy this cash into a house. And, and the mortgage rate or the payment might be a little bit more affordable. What do you think about that? Like, will, will cutting rates really lead to a pretty significant melt up? I think so. I think so. Because when rates come down and people can no longer get that money from a high yield savings account, they can no longer get that 4%, 4.5% from a high yield savings account, they're, they move out on the risk curve, right? So they move into riskier investments. And so with asset prices already at or near all time highs, that means this whole idea of 100K Bitcoin really very much is in play. I don't think that with these incremental 25 basis point rate cuts, you're going to see that immediately. But I think you're going to start to see that capital shift uh, out of those high yield savings accounts, out of uh, treasuries and into those higher yielding assets. Obviously, treasuries are in a bull market right now. And so correlations really have flipped. Nobody likes paying taxes. And Bitcoin savers could be leaving a lot of money on the table if they don't have a sound financial plan and tax strategy. Sound Advisory is a leading financial advisory firm with over $150 million of assets under advisement. They'll work with you to optimize and file your taxes with Bitcoin-friendly CPAs, while also developing personalized financial strategies that align with your specific goals. Check out Sound Advisory at thesoundadvisory.com for more information. That's thesoundadvisory.com. Now back to the show quite some time, there was, uh, there was this kind of inverse correlation between stocks and bonds. 
And now uh, they're once again positively correlated. People will look at that and go, that means a recession is imminent. Well, no, not necessarily. Uh, what rates are pricing in is slowing inflation and a return uh, back down to a more neutral policy. They're not pricing in recession. If they were pricing in recession, rates would have fallen through the floor already and Powell would have already started cutting rates. So I think that uh, there definitely will be a move out on the risk curve, but it will be more gradual. Um, and I think that's probably going to be how the market starts positioning itself once uh, more of these traders are back on their desks after Labor Day. I think you're going to see a gradual risk on move uh, out on the risk curve as these high yield options in, you know, in idle money market funds no longer become available. You know, once that 5% in a money market fund, 5.5% becomes 3%, 3.5% over the next several months, it's going to be much less enticing compared to Bitcoin's you know, year over year uh, 50% plus returns. Right, the 100% uh, return that we have seen, more than 100% return that we've seen since January on Bitcoin. Things like Bitcoin will become way more enticing. Uh, Bitcoin being an absolutely scarce asset, that's where I would want to park uh, my money. Absolutely, right. Moving out of this uh, kind of risk off phase, um, you know, and we've we've been in a bull market anyway, so it, it, we're not even in this risk off period. Um, but with rates coming back down, these these at these uh, safe assets, um, you know, these U.S. Treasuries, these money market funds, these high yield savings accounts. They're not going to be enticing to people anymore. And so I do think that that is a, another big catalyst uh, for uh, a prolonged bull market, not just kind of a knee-jerk reaction, the Fed cuts rates to zero, but this gradual incremental 25 basis point uh, by 25 basis point, month by month, meeting by meeting reduction is going to lead to a commensurate uh, multi-month, potentially multi-year continuation of the bear market Bitcoin is experiencing. And in that event, which I think is pretty likely, uh, then we see Bitcoin move to 100K way faster. Do you know like what the actual expectations are for the Fed to cut rates like by the end of next year or over the next 12 months or so? Do you have any idea of like what the Fed funds rate might be in there for T bills might be in there for like your high yield savings account might be? Yeah, absolutely. So here is my uh, terminal. I'm going to share this screen and then it can get cleaned up uh, later. This is world interest rate probability. And this is uh, in the Bloomberg terminal. This gets created by overnight index swaps, which are basically a liquidity tool for overnight lending between banks to meet like cash needs. Um, if I have something that I want to post and I want to gain an overnight yield, I have too much cash, somebody needs cash. This is the market that banks go to to lend to each other on an overnight basis. And from this, you can actually construct where the market thinks the Fed funds rate is going to go based on the rates that are being charged out in the future on uh, overnight index swaps. And you can see, this is where the market thinks the Fed is going to take rates over the next year. So by July of 2025, they think the Fed is going to bring Fed funds, which is its main policy rate, down from 5.3%, roughly, where the effective federal funds rate is now, to 3.3%. And you can see it's moving in real time to 3.3%. And so they think, the market thinks, that there's going to be an aggregate 200 basis point reduction in the federal funds rate down to 3.3% over the next several months now. It's important to note that because this is a liquid overnight market that's get, that gets traded constantly, this can change on a dime. This can change very quickly. But currently, this is where the market is pricing the Fed's going to take rates. And so we have to look at this and say, okay, if the market thinks the Fed's going to bring rates down to 3.5% by next July, how are they going to position, how is the market going to position itself within assets? We know that they're going to buy treasuries because if the market thinks the Fed is going to take rates to 3.5%, then I want to get, I want to scoop up you know, the three-month T-bill while it's still 5.1%, which it is right now. Um, and so you're going to see a lot of money flowing into those, uh, into those instruments out of things like uh, stocks, out of things like Bitcoin. But on a longer time horizon, those investments, those T-bills are going to become less enticing. Uh, people are going to want to move into those higher, uh, you know, those higher yielding options, things like Bitcoin, where they can get a, a much higher return. So this is where the market thinks the Fed is going to take rates uh, and as a result, you've seen treasuries in a pretty big bull market. Um, twos, uh, tens not too long ago, ago were at 5.5%. Now they're at 3.8%. Um, twos, similarly, were right around 5.1, 5.2. Now they're at 3.9%. And so the market thinks the Fed is going to bring rates uh, down. And so it's bidding up the U.S. Treasury curve. But also, that doesn't mean that capital gets sucked away from risk assets immediately. Um, or any, any you know, material uh, worsening uh, in risk assets occurs at all. It doesn't necessarily mean we flip into a bear market because like I mentioned earlier, more treasury issuance means more balance sheet 
Um, and what liquidity is, is the capacity of capital, its balance sheet capacity. And so we can infer from the US Treasury issuing all these treasuries, uh, let's say a lot of them get purchased by banks, um, those get levered up. God knows uh, banks love leveraging up on their US Treasuries. Just ask Silicon Valley Bank um, and Signature Bank, right? Those Treasuries are going to get levered up. Uh, there's going to be plenty of balance sheet capacity to go around. And then ultimately, that flows into uh, a higher proclivity to lend, higher proclivity to move out on the risk curve for these banks, and more capital for investors to deploy into things like stocks and Bitcoin. And so, yeah, kind of long winded answer, but that's where the market thinks the Fed is taking rates. And um, over the next several months, I believe that that is what, what's going to happen. That's how people are going to position themselves in asset market. Do you think rates will, in like the medium term, uh, eventually go back down to zero? Or do you think we'll have like this melt up, you know, over the next you know, 12 to 24 months and then maybe see like another wave of inflation and then rates will have to go back up again? Do you, which, which do you kind of see playing out or, or, or either or maybe something different? For sure. So every single cycle, the Fed eases, they tighten by too much and they ease by too much. It's kind of a hallmark of the Federal Reserve. In 2019, Powell almost got away with engineering a soft landing. So a soft landing is basically when um, unemployment remains steady while inflation returns back down to the Fed's long run 2% target. There's no recession. Inflation normalizes without a recession. That's essentially what a soft landing is. The Fed can raise rates to normalize inflation. Inflation normalizes and they begin bringing rates back down. We almost did it successfully. And in that period, the S&P 500 rallied 12.5%. Unfortunately, COVID threw, all, threw a wrench in all of that. COVID caused the S&P 500 to fall by 33%, caused Bitcoin to fall by more than 50%, right? So what happened after this was obviously the Federal Reserve had to step in and slash rates almost all the way down to zero. And so this event had nothing to do with uh, the economy or markets deteriorating on like a factor that had to do with financial plumbing, like anything the Fed can really control. So the Fed really effectively managed last cycle, but COVID threw a wrench in all of it. It did all this huge monetary bazooka. Money supply increased by you know 40%, and then we got 9.1% inflation. Uh, those factors are impossible to predict. It's impossible to predict the next COVID or next crisis that doesn't have to do with financial markets. Um, but causes this to happen in the economy, causes uh, the Fed to have to cut rates down to zero in order to stimulate the economy and 9.1% inflation. So it's impossible for me to predict if an event like that will happen. Um, what I do think, though, is that Jerome Powell has managed this cycle very effectively. I don't know if the next Fed chair will be able to. Um, so Jerome Powell's term is up either next year or the following year. It's, it's up within the next couple of years. I don't think the next Fed speaker uh, the next chairman of the Federal Reserve will be able to manage the cycle as well as Powell has. And so that means I think the Fed's going to go back to what it has done historically, which is uh, tighten too much and then be too late to the party, generate a huge amount of unemployment. People get thrown out of work. They cause a recession. They have to slam rates down to zero. And then as a result of that, we get huge inflation. So I think that when the Fed inevitably uh, has to slash interest rates way below the neutral rate, uh, the neutral rate right now is projected to be like three and a half percent right around there. That's why markets are pricing. That's where the Fed's going to take rates. Um, I think that the next thing that causes the Fed to have to, to cut rates way below that will, um, will be a result of policy error. It'll be a result of whatever the next Fed speaker does. I think without some kind of COVID uh, sudden deflationary event that nobody can predict, I think that we're kind of Ceteris paribus in for uh, a return down to a three and a half percent neutral policy rate. Price inflation normalizes. We don't get a huge deflationary shock that causes the Fed to have to slash rates, which generates a whole bunch for inflation in the long run. For now, I don't see that happening, but those things can change overnight, like we saw um, in 2019 with the repo crisis, like we saw in 2020 with COVID, and like we saw last year with uh, what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. And so there are a number of factors that are totally unpredictable. Uh, so for now, I'm going to go with the market's pricing of a slow and gradual return to the 3.5% policy rate. Price inflation normalizes. Um, all is well in the world. But what could happen is if there's too much risk taking as a result of what the Fed's doing, uh, you could see the wealth effect generate more inflation. And price inflation stays stuck at 3%. Um, we're running a $1.5 trillion deficit while the economy is booming. If we continue doing that while we cut rates um, and the, the Treasury issues even more debt because rates are lower, then uh, you could see price inflation stay at 3% or even go up higher again to 35 to 4%. Um, 
but that's not my base case. I think the most likely scenario is that, uh, again, we return to normal uh, with the policy rate and with inflation. Um, but who knows that the next Fed speaker might not be able to manage it as well as Jerome Powell has or any number of unforeseen deflationary shocks, whether it's a virus uh, that comes in from China or whether it's something else could change all of this overnight. It could make uh, it could force the Fed's hand to pump uh, liquidity or print money proverbially as we call proverbially as we call it into markets. These things can happen overnight. And so um, I think hedging your bets for that scenario by allocating to hard assets and having some cash on hand to, to, to buy the dip um, is a very good idea, but it's not my base case. That makes sense. Um, this is kind of a question that I'm sure, you know, everyone would love to know the exact answer to, and it's impossible to actually know, but where do you think Bitcoin ends at the end of 2025? And what are you going to be monitor, monitoring to, to try to figure out, like, is liquidity, you know, super hot right now? Is it going to continue to be super hot? And then like, at what point will, you know, liquidity about to it is about to change and and the rise of bitcoin might be like topping and, and and needs to come back down like where do you think bitcoin is you know 18 months from now or so mm-hmm. yeah so i'm going to be watching central bank balance sheets i'm going to be watching interest rates from central banks uh, or set by central banks and i'm going to be watching credit spreads those are the three main things i'm going to be watching right now uh central bank balance sheets uh are being reduced uh excuse me the fed's balance sheet is being reduced other central banks balance sheets are not and so on net, central bank balance sheets are positive and growing. And so that's thing number one that I'm going to be watching for to, to see where Bitcoin's going. The other thing is central bank policy rates. The Fed, everyone's cutting. The Fed is kind of the, the, Fed is kind of the, uh, the, the first to hike and the last to cut, right? Um, we know the ECB was really late to the party with hiking rates. And as a result, it had its own huge inflation problem. The Fed is usually the first to hike and the, first, and, and the last to cut. And so other central banks have been easing. They have been increasing the size of their balance sheet or moderating it or even running it off slowly while cutting rates. The Fed is about to start doing the same. It has slowed the pace of reducing the size of its balance sheet and it's going to start cutting rates. So those are two things. Those are two easing impulses. And then what that flows into is uh, the easiness of uh, uh, businesses to borrow, right? Credit spreads. Uh, what this, the premium at which businesses have to borrow over the prevailing risk-free rate in the market. And those are still at cycle lows um, uh, or cycle tights, rather. And so with credit spreads still so muted, it tells me borrowing is still very easy for businesses. So that means risk on. That means game on. It means it makes it much easier for businesses to borrow. Um, It means that it improves um, future cash flows. And as a result, uh, stock prices do really well. Uh, If credit spreads begin to widen out, um, and we start to see them uh, materially widen out over several months. That means a risk off impulse kind of kicks in in the market where it's not as easy for businesses to borrow. Future cash flows um, uh, and forward cash flow estimates get reduced. Stock prices don't do well. And, and it's all a correlation game. Bitcoin is tightly correlated with stocks. It gets dragged down with it in the same way that Bitcoin obviously performs well, doesn't have a board of directors. So it performs well when uh, global liquidity is expanding. It also is tightly correlated to things like stocks. In this Frontier moment, Joe is talking about Bitcoin being tightly correlated with stocks and global liquidity. I just made this interesting chart highlighting how accurate this is. Historically, Bitcoin experiences major price bottoms right as the S&P 500 does too. This occurred in 2015, 2018, 2020, and 2022. To some extent, this highlights how the market is all one trade buy high quality assets against the debasing US dollar. And of these high quality assets, Bitcoin has been the fastest horse. And now back to Joe. I think that correlation is going to break one day when the market finally fully realizes that this is an absolutely scarce asset, not a tech stock. But for the time being, if credit spreads start widening out, like if this funding stress begins and it starts hurting stock prices, Bitcoin is going to get hurt too. Um, But for the time being, central bank balance sheets are either uh, moderating or expanding. Um, Some some of them are reducing the size of their balance sheet, like the United States. But on net, uh, total global assets uh, on central bank balance sheets are expanding, as we saw in the liquidity model I just showed you. Also, central banks, now the Fed is joining their ranks, are cutting rates, and credit spreads are still very muted. And so all three of those things are excellent conditions uh, for price predictors for Bitcoin. It It means risk on. Uh, you know, ceteris paribus, as long as the economy doesn't well and the, does well and these rate cuts 
don't turn from maintenance rate cuts to maintain the same level of uh, financial uh, kind of financial easiness that we have now. If they flip into crisis rate cuts, that means other risk assets don't do well. Everything sells off except for U.S. Treasuries. Rates get slashed down to zero. I think those three things, right? As long as the economy holds up, are, are what are what's going to be the biggest price predictors for Bitcoin over the next 12, 18 months. Um, and if we can engineer what Powell was on the cusp of engineering in 2019, which is a soft landing, a return to 2% price inflation while maintaining growth and not plunging us into a recession, um, then credit spread, you know, and, and the Fed is, a, and along with other central banks, are able to ease and credit spreads remain muted. I think it's really uh, all bets are off for where Bitcoin's going to head. Um, of course, it's less mind bogglingly rocket ship like than if there were a crisis and the Fed had to cut and had to do this huge buying program directly from the U.S. Treasury, injecting all this cash from the economy, that makes for like a face-melting Bitcoin rally. But if conditions remain the way that they are, financial conditions remain easy, central banks around the world maintain this easing impulse of uh, you know, increasing their balance sheets moderately or keeping them at the same level while, um, while rates get cut, then I think that's rocket fuel for Bitcoin in a, in a much more muted way than if it were a crisis. So I think over the next 12 to 18 months, you could see something like 2x upside over Bitcoin very easily if these conditions remain intact. And then if we get a recession, uh, we get there even faster because we know the easing impulse, not just the Fed, but global central banks, um, you know, kicks in overnight. And we've seen how they react in the 2020, 2021 bull market for Bitcoin. So really either way, uh, Bitcoin goes up, right? At the end of the day, um, you know, liquidity expands, right? We haven't seen, uh, you know, liquidity just doesn't contract over time. More people are born the financialization of the world uh, continues. Uh, So balance sheets always expand. Um, Cycles always resolve in the exact same way. Bitcoin will go up regardless. For me, it's just about the pace at which Bitcoin goes up. Um, If we achieve that kind of soft landing where there doesn't end up being a recession, um, uh, but there is financial easiness, Bitcoin goes up. If there is a recession in which the Fed and other central banks are forced to respond with emergency easiness, Bitcoin goes up even faster. Yeah, that that's definitely seems reasonable. I love how you guys have created that the TBL liquidity metric. Um, and it's interesting to see like, while that's not a model and it obviously doesn't forward project liquidity or doesn't forward project the price, it is interesting to kind of gauge where global liquidity is at. Mm-hmm. On the topic though of like metrics and models, what are your thoughts on like the power law model and the stock to flow model? I guess like if you if you're expecting, you know, if if things continue and Bitcoin does a, a 2x increase in, in its price from where it is today, then that's probably more like closer to the power model or at least power law model, or at least on like the idea of diminishing returns. Like we're not going to go to $500,000 um, you know, by the end of next year. Do you have an opinion on the models? Um, and then do you, on, on top of that, like, do you have an idea of like this idea of diminishing returns? Is that, is that kind of your, your base case or your, your, your thought process? For sure. So all models are wrong. All models are wrong, but some are useful, right? We've seen the power, uh, the power law model is useful. The stock to flow model is absolute garbage, right? Because the stock to flow model tries to model uh, Bitcoin's price, excuse me, using, um, you know, its issuance schedule over time. And we've seen that that alone is not a good predictor for price, right? It failed a while ago. Uh, whereas the power law model, it also adds in um, an exponential factor to the time. And so it models out the, dimin- the naturally diminishing returns of an asset as it grows larger in size. And so I ascribe more credence to the power law model than I do to something like the stock to flow model, which is more of kind of this moon boy model that was severely invalidated as soon as price moved in the wrong direction. Um, but uh, the power law model is certainly something I can, I can sink my teeth into and look at as completely reasonable. Um, a lower bound for Bitcoin um, by you know, next year of something like, $34,000, that's totally reasonable. And that's what the power law model posits. Um, in the same way, uh, like a bull case model, if we end up getting recession after recession after recession, um, you know, looking at the power law model, like 700,000 Bitcoin, $700,000 Bitcoin by 2030, that also seems reasonable. So the power law model to me is more reasonable because like you said, it does factor in diminishing marginal return, diminishing returns rather as Bitcoin grows as an asset whereas the stock to flow model really didn't effectively factor that in. So the power law model is useful in illustrating what Bitcoin has done and what it could do, um, given our current monetary situation, fiscal situation, not just in the US, but globally. So uh, looking at the power law model, I lend 
way more credence to something like that as a uh, future uh, kind of not predictor, but kind of gauge for where price could be. Um, whereas the stock to flow model, in my opinion, it's it's just uh, it's garbage. It's completely useless at this point. I think I, I I asked Nick this question when I talked to him last time. I, I want to hear your thoughts as well. Like like you, like you mentioned, 2020 we had like unprecedented global uh, fiscal stimulus, unprecedented monetary stimulus. Um, everything went went up. GameStop went up. Dogecoin went up. Bitcoin went up. At, you know, S and P 500, real estate, everything went up. Thinking back to like 2017, at least when I when I was paying attention. Bitcoin, like everything was kind of going up at the time, but Bitcoin was going like parabolic. Like, and it was kind of like one of the only things going parabolic. And, uh, and I think that's how people like learned about Bitcoin. Like, obviously, most people don't really get Bitcoin. They're not paying attention. And number go up is kind of the way that encourages them to try to learn more about it, whether they, they see the number go up and they're like, oh, I need to read the Bitcoin standard or whatnot. Point of all saying that was like, do you think that too much monetary stimulus and like these, you know, recessionary periods followed by multi-trillion dollar deficit spending and, and massive quantitative easing. If after that occurs and we see, you know, game stock go to the moon, everything kind of go to the moon, does that like cloud the judgment of everyone that doesn't fully understand Bitcoin yet? Because kind of like I would mention, like number go up is kind of how people learn about Bitcoin. But if it all happens at the same time, like kind of like 2021, yes, like Bitcoin did pretty much better than everything else but also so like most people were just like well everything's going up right now like so i don't really care that much do you think that that plays a role in, like clouding price signals and maybe even like hindering adoption to some extent or or not really like it's still just going to outperform pretty much everything mm -hmm. yeah it clouds the it clouds people's judgment who are new to bitcoin that don't understand the value proposition yet because in 2020 and 2021 yeah, Bitcoin's mooning, but also GameStop is mooning, you know, a, a Dogecoin is mooning, right? So when people see everything else going up because of this unprecedented monetary and fiscal stimulus, they think, well, you know, Bitcoin's just, it's just another lottery ticket. I think that for Bitcoin's adoption and its long-term growth, it's much better for it to outperform when other things aren't even coming close to it, right? When other equities aren't coming close to it, um, when these kind of uh, other crypto things, and we put those in quotation marks in the Bitcoin layer, are not going up as fast as Bitcoin is. Um, and so for me, we have the boom and bust cycle, but it's better if those are, if the, if the monetary expansion and fiscal expansion that comes on the downturn of that in order to re-stimulate the economy isn't as massive as it was in 2020 and 2021. I think that uh, for better long-term education and adoption of Bitcoin, um, people need to understand what the asset is, and that's absolute scarcity. Its rule set is immutable. Um, you can't change its monetary policy. Learning those things in an environment where other assets aren't mooning in price, just like Bitcoin is, uh, is better than just as you said, if everything is mooning at the same time. Um, but I do think that uh, boom and bust cycles, they're inevitable. Powell has been able to avert one so far. Um, Looking at all of the data in its totality, it looks like he might be able to do it this time for the very first time, i.e. a soft landing. So like the expansion at the other, at the other, on the other side of what we're experiencing now, this kind of moderation um, being more muted, I think that's better for Bitcoin in the long term because all the other stuff dies. You don't see penny stocks go to the moon. None of these crypto tokens are surviving. Uh, even Ethereum is dying on the vine, right? So that ultimately for me is better. It's better for people to see that Bitcoin can exist and thrive and grow in a universe where it's not just driven by this excess fiscal and monetary stimulus. It's better for me for Bitcoin to, to grow into what it, what it is, which is an absolutely scarce asset, to, to grow to $100,000, $500,000, a million dollars in price when other things aren't having the same uh, or similar percentage returns, right? Uh, so I think you're exactly right. For Bitcoin, it's inevitable. Bitcoin is inevitable. It's an idea whose time has come. Um, the debt situation isn't going away. Our monetary response to the economy and the debt situation is not going away. So Bitcoin stands to benefit in the face of all of it. But for me, it'd be better if we had less of the 2020 and 2021 events uh, for Bitcoin's adoption. Because people, they just, Bitcoin, people get into Bitcoin for number go up. But if it's only number go up, 
that it's never going to become what we want it to, which is this uh, base layer global reserve asset. It's just going to be another, it, it could just be perceived as a lottery ticket. Um, so yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I do think it's better for Bitcoin if we get fewer of these massive emergency monetary and fiscal stimulus. Um, Bitcoin isn't reliant on narrative, but it is helped by narratives. And so if the narrative is that every four years, the Fed slashes rates to zero and pumps trillions of dollars into the economy, then that's what makes Bitcoin go up. That's not necessarily great for Bitcoin in the long run uh, or its perception. But if more and more people learn about the problem and how Bitcoin is the best way for them to hedge themselves against it, and that's why they buy Bitcoin, I think that's better for long-term adoption and ultimately stability in Bitcoin's price. Yeah, no, that that definitely makes sense to me. I mean, it, and it makes sense for, like from the perspective, I feel like, of every business where it's like if you're an oil producer and the price of oil is $100 a bale, barrel and the economy is booming, and then all of a sudden in 2020, the price of oil goes to $0 a barrel. It's like you can't even operate a pretty standard business when the price of things are just hyper volatile. One day they're super high, the next day they're negative or zero. So it's like that's just going to cloud you know, market signals for any sort of entrepreneur or management team that's operating a, a real business, which I feel like is just bad for everybody, not just Bitcoin probably. It is. Yeah. You know, over time, obviously, volatility is a feature of Bitcoin. It's not a bug. It's an asset that's monetizing. It's only $1.3 trillion in size now compared to the $10, $12 trillion global, uh, gold market, thir- you know, the 30 something trillion dollar size of the S&P 500. It is inherently more volatile, but uh, that's a feature. It's not a bug. People seeing Bitcoin's volatility now, um, you know, it, it's a proxy for global liquidity and a proxy of the, for the situation that we're in. So obviously this problem is very present, uh, but for that to go away as Bitcoin grows in size, I think it's important that the people who are holding it understand what it is and they're not just using it as a lottery ticket. And I think that's what they're doing. Yeah. Um, on the topic of, of crypto more broadly, is crypto actually dying? Like I feel like over the last, you know, maybe in a few months, basically since, since the merge, probably more than a year at this point, ETH has kind of been crashing, in, at least in Bitcoin terms. And it seems like, at least from the few crypto people that I still follow, that most people have kind of come to the conclusion that crypto is kind of a joke. Like they're betting on meme coins and, and dog with hat token and Dogecoin or, or whatever. I don't even know really what they are, but they've kind of given up on the idea that like these things have any utility and they're just going to go for like the most garbage trash thing and hope greater fools come in and buy the, the meme token and then they can sell it. Is that, am I right with that? Or like, how are you thinking about what's happening right now? You're right on the money because, and I'll pull up the chart now. If you view Ethereum as the mother of all crypto tokens, right? These, you know, these crap coins, I don't want to curse on the podcast. Um, you know, these crap coins, if you view it as kind of the mother of all of them, then what we can do is look at Ethereum relative to Bitcoin to see what the dominance of these assets is. And uh, yeah, not looking good. You can see in 2022 how, Obviously, 2017 was a different story. It, it, it too was a huge hype cycle. Ethereum relative to Bitcoin was surging. It was going to be the next big thing. Ethereum relative to Bitcoin has had diminishing returns cycle after cycle. And so therefore, crypto cycle after cycle um, has been less dominant relative to Bitcoin. And now this is actually the first bull market where Ethereum is not rising relative to Bitcoin. And that's a huge narrative violation. That's a huge narrative violation because what's supposed to happen is that Ethereum is supposed to give you beta. It's, gonna, it's supposed to give you higher percentage returns relative to what Bitcoin can give you. This time it hasn't done that. And so since the merge, uh, what has happened is uh, we, we obviously had uh, a very tiny spike, like a, this, this kind of baby spike almost um, in Ethereum's price relative to Bitcoin, but it has now been in this secular downtrend since then. And it's not looking good uh, for Ethereum. I'll give, you, I'll give you a proxy that's really easy to understand. The Bitcoin ETFs did extremely well when they launched. Uh, the number two and, or excuse me, the number three and number nine ETFs in terms of year-to-date flows this year have been the BlackRock and Fidelity Bitcoin ETFs. And so that, that shows there's staying power in Bitcoin. There's market interest in absolute verifiable scarcity from, you know, these ETF investors, these seasoned, who we're, we're supposed to consider these seasoned investors. Ethereum ETFs have been the exact opposite. Um, they have seen, uh, so far, they launched in July, They've seen an eight-day streak of net outflows that have totaled over $110 million. In that same period, Bitcoin has had two consecutive days, um, and I'm talking Friday and Monday, of $250 million and then $200 million net inflows, respectively, in the same time that 
the Ethereum ETF saw net outflows. Not only is that not how Bitcoin behaved only a month after its ETFs launch, but it's not how the Bitcoin ETFs are behaving now. And so with what happened with FTX in 2022 and Celsius in 2022 uh, and Terra Luna in 2022 and all these things that have exploded because money is no longer free, the value proposition of Bitcoin as a lottery ticket, if you can buy the right one, it's a game of greater fools. That's going away and going away fast. When money is no longer free, fake money dies. And that's what happened and is happening to crypto. It's a really slow and painful death that for me is best visible in the Ethereum to Bitcoin price. I like to call ETH BTC um, the crap coin electrocardiogram because in the same way that when somebody is dying, their EKG peters out, the EKG for cryptocurrency compared to Bitcoin, uh, which has nothing to do with these things, is also petering out as well. Uh, and it's not necessarily a vote of confidence for Ethereum when the Ethereum Foundation sells $96 million worth of the token that it created last Friday. Um, obviously, on a year-to-date basis, Bitcoin is up 42%. Ethereum is only up 10%. But on a more macro basis, taking the dollar out of the equation and switching the denominator to Bitcoin, which is the king of the industry because it is the industry, um, you see in very real terms that, that these other assets are dying relative to Bitcoin. The perceived utility is going away very quickly. Uh, and over the next several years, um, crypto uh, will be relegated to what it actually is, which is a series of affinity scams that attempt to ride the coattails of the very real and revolutionary asset that is big. Um, so yeah, I do believe that you know, crypto more broadly is dying. That is a very good thing um, because fewer people will be scammed, more people will be drawn into uh, what this whole industry is all about, which is uh, preserving your wealth in Bitcoin. And uh, it is a very slow and painful death. Yeah, I mean, that definitely seems to be exactly what's happening, um, at least over the last you know, 12, 12 to 18 months or so. Um, what do you think about like various parts of the world kind of like accelerating right now? Like, I feel like we're technology with, with AI has kind of been accelerating like LLMs and chat GPT. That's, that's been becoming very revolutionary just in a relatively short period of time compared to like the history of technology advancements you know, throughout humanity. We also have like physical and monetary stuff accelerating. And, and now we have like Bitcoin, hyper Bitcoinization, like to some extent that's accelerating. Like, do you think we're all of these things are like converging and colliding and accelerating at the exact same time? I do think so. I do think so. I started this off by saying everything is accelerating. So Bitcoin is too. And that's what we're experiencing. Our ability as a civilization to harness energy is rapidly, I'd say exponentially increasing. And so, you know, the whole, there's this whole movement in Silicon Valley, and I ascribe to it. It's called effective accelerationism. It's essentially um, kind of this techno capital stack, these people working on uh, allowing humanity to advance to a point where we're using all available energy. Um, and at the end of the day, you and I know, Joe, that energy is prosperity, energy equals human flourishing. The reason the industrial, we've had the industrial revolution, and then we have, we've had uh, a century plus of, of all of the fruits of what we've experienced as a result of that is because of energy, dense, immediately transferable energy that you can call up at any moment. And that's only gotten better and better and better. Um, you know, o- only a little over 100 years ago, were we flying, were the Wright, Wright brothers flying their plane uh, for the very first time. And now, uh, you know, uh, a, a little bit over 50 years later, we landed a man on the moon. And now we're having commercial space flight with rockets uh, that are made by private companies that can, that with boosters and, ro- you know, boosters that can now land upright, right? And we can reuse them. And so in a very short, it's, it's hard to argue that in the thousands of years of humanity, um, it's, it's not on this exponential curve um, because that's what we're experiencing, right? You witness it with, I just, I just gave space flight as an example, but there's so many other examples um, of acceleration of humanity being able to use its resources in an exponentially more efficient way every single year. You see it in computer processors, right? With Moore's law, um, computer, computer efficiency is an exponential function. Every two years or so, uh, you know, uh, these, uh, these computing units get 50% smaller and 50% smaller and 50% smaller, and that's exponentially more efficient. And so as a civilization, we really are at a crossroads. We have this acceleration from every standpoint. I just talked about kind of the fiscal and monetary picture. That's accelerating, but it's accelerating in a bad way. It's, it's deteriorating uh, at an exponential rate. You know, as a country now, 
we went from uh, 20, 30 years ago, interest expense was a line item. And now it is our biggest single expense every single year. It's more than military spending. So the fiscal and monetary situation is accelerating. It's getting acceleratingly worse. Um, uh, from the standpoint of energy utilization, we are getting uh, exponentially better at using all available energy. Um, and Bitcoin exists within all of that to benefit from it. Um, because at the end of the day, if we're talking about energy and utilizing energy more efficiently, we've seen it in Texas. Bitcoin offers, not only is it energy currency in that it can be mined totally independent of location, as long as you have some source of energy, you can monetize it anywhere. In this frontier moment, Joe is talking about exponential growth on a number of different fronts. Another example that came to mind is from my report, Your Wealth is Melting, where we researched the historical productivity of one U.S. farmer. One farmer went from feeding four people in the year 1800 to feeding 155 people in 2010. And the growth in productivity is accelerating. From 1800 to 1950, the compound annual growth rate was 1.08%. And from 1950 to 2010, the compound annual growth rate was 3.47%. Now imagine the current and future wave of AI and robotics. This will again likely only accelerate the productivity of farmers and so many other industries in the rest of the economy. Tie that into Bitcoin's perfect scarcity, and the purchasing power of Bitcoin could one day be hard to fathom. And now back to Joe. In the same way that that's happening in Texas, the United States is now at a crossroads. Are we going to look at something like Bitcoin and say, this is the future. We're going we're gonna to turn the nuclear plants back on. Uh, we're going to start building more nuclear plants. We're going to start uh, drilling and using all the available gas that we have, all of the uh, uh, LNG that we have underneath our surface in the United States, of which there's a lot that we just haven't touched. We're very energy rich. Are we going to have Bitcoin at the center of that? Um, have it become a mainstay of uh, how we operate as a country. Because in the same way that using all the available energy that we have as a nation brings up human flourishing, putting Bitcoin at the center of that, uh, not just from making the best conditions for mining and making a company, but making the best conditions for people to allocate to Bitcoin, right? There are countries that are very hostile to Bitcoin. You can't own it in some countries. Um, the United States is at a crossroads with this upcoming election. And I'll say, and I don't get political, but there's one side of the aisle that is uh, very pessimistic and uh, you know, self-centered and they're hedonistic about the future uh, and they want to regress. They want us to use solar panels and wind turbines and all of these things that have proven to be very energy inefficient. And there's the other side of it, and that means less human flourishing. And there's the other side of the aisle that wants to use more energy. They want to use as much energy as we can. They want to they frack. They want to use all the LNG that we've got. Um, they want to uh, you know, reignite the nuclear movement, start building more power plants. That means more energy per human. That means more human flourishing. So the United States is really at a crossroads. As a civilization, we can either choose to ascend the Kardashev gradient toward a Kardashev type one civilization where we're maximizing human flourishing because we're maximizing uh, all of the utilization of the energy that we have as not just as a country, but as a planet. Um, or we can regress, right? We can regress as a country. We can use less energy ultimately until we're uh, kind of a socialist nation that is regressed to using horse and buggy to get around. Those are the two visions of the future, uh, not just that the world is grappling with, and that the country will be forced to grapple with very soon. So everything is accelerating. And as an individual, you have a choice. Uh, you have a choice. And not to, I'm not talking about the election, obviously. You have a choice, right? You can either accept that this is what's happening based on what we've observed and what we're observing now, Everything is accelerating, technology, uh, energy efficiency, and Bitcoin. And you could choose to hop onto that movement, begin allocating to Bitcoin, um, and begin you know, openly advocating for the use of more energy, or you can begin regressing, saying things like Bitcoin are bad for the environment, taking the Elizabeth Warren stance on things, and advocating that we regress. If we regress, that means less human flourishing. Less energy per human means less human flourishing. More energy per human means more human flourishing. Uh, and as Bitcoiners, it's kind of central to our ethos that all we care about is human flourishing. The reason Bitcoin was created was to serve as a hedge against central bankers, right? A um, uh, uh, bank, uh, a chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks was what was inscribed in the Genesis block. And so it's really core to the Bitcoiners way of operating that we want maximal human flourishing. And I think within that, uh, everything's accelerating. 
chat GPT wasn't a thing several years ago, wasn't a viable product that now you're seeing, uh, uh, even last year, AI to video is terrible. And now I'm scrolling my Twitter feed and I'm seeing direct to consumer brands making uh, AI videos based on image prompts that they can then go, they're, they're good enough to go and use as ads, right? So we're at that. Um, and so this inflection point, obviously for humanity also brings us to like an individual decision. Do you want to hop on that train? Do you want to hop on that train, allocate to Bitcoin, begin advocating for uh, more energy and self-sovereignty and down with the central banks? Or do you want to regress, right? Um, and I think it's everyone's, everyone's decision on this call, listening to something, uh, this, this call, this podcast called the Bitcoin frontier uh, that I know exactly what side you're on. You're pro-humanity, you're pro-human flourishing. And therefore, in this accelerating environment, in this exponential environment where we're headed um, as a people, right? As a species, you're pro Bitcoin as well. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, I saw actually this, this uh, Twitter thread or something that was talking about Reed Hoffman, who's one of the, the founders of, or he is the founder of LinkedIn. And he basically said that like with AI and various technology advancements, pretty likely that within like 10 to 20 years, very common things will get a thousand times cheaper. Like that was his own words of what he said. That seems kind of out there to some people, but to me, it seems also potentially maybe not that order of magnitude, but it seems like we are on the cusp of technology accelerating at a pace that we haven't quite seen before. And the implications for like that and, and the purchasing power of Bitcoin could be pretty interesting. I agree. I agree. Things are about to become, you know, they already are becoming the natural order of things is deflationary. Jeff Booth talks about this. Um, a thousand times cheaper seems like a massive massive leap. But if you think in terms of exponential functions, uh, it isn't. Uh, it's actually very close. Uh, but as Bitcoiners, you know, as a civilization, we need a currency to underlie all of this exponential growth um, and exponentially increasing in efficiency that actually aligns with all of that, with the natural tendency of humanity to become more efficient. Um, if we have a currency that underlies all of these technological achievements and this natural deflation that is inflationary, humans won't be able to capture it, but you will be able to capture all of the gains of this exponential movement, of this exponential growth. Um, what Reid Hoffman th said, things becoming a thousand times cheaper, definitely not in US dollar terms, but absolutely in Bitcoin terms. But I agree. Um, two more questions, then we can uh, really start to close this out. And you can give fairly short answers to these if you want. But um, the first one is, what do you believe that most Bitcoiners would disagree with? Hmm. What do I believe that most Bitcoiners would disagree with? I would believe I believe that national pride um, in being a nationalist is something that uh, is extremely important for yourself and for your family. Uh, we always talk about self sovereignty, but if there are no borders, if there is no strong family unit, if there's no sense of national pride, if there's no sense of identity and who you are as a person and the idea of shared values, then you can't be self sovereign. Best of luck. Right when all of the world, there's no differentiation between countries. There's no competition between countries to give you the best standard of living. Good luck having a good standard of living. So for me, um, I'm very you know now a lot of people come into Bitcoin. They're libertarians, right? They want to end the Fed. Um, you know, good luck, uh, good good luck with that, right? Um, personally, right? Uh, for for me, um, being a nationalist is uh, is very important. Uh, and it's it's much more aligned with the the ethos of Bitcoin than I think libertarianism is. Um, so I think a, a lot of Bitcoiners would staunchly disagree with that. Certainly, a lot of the OG Bitcoiners, like being a nationalist, uh, you know, is is something that's a bad thing. Um, being a libertarian is much more kind of what they're suited to, and it's certainly what I began as. Um, but as I matured, I, I recognized the value and the inherent need um, for uh, uh, shared values for. Um, something that we can we can all agree on: uh, national pride, borders, uh, a strong family unit, um, even a shared religion. Right, extremely important. We were founded as a Christian nation, and so the, th that is probably the biggest thing uh, for me that is very important. And I'd stress uh, to anyone is very important to take take pride in where you're from. People might be listening from other countries as well. Have a sense of national pride and have a sense of wanting to preserve uh, what your people, not just preserve, build a top of what your people left, right? Your ancestors were not evil. Your country uh, might do bad things, um, but you are your people. And the moment you uh, say that you are not your people, uh, inevitably that invites people who want to usurp you. Um, and so I think uh, 
being a nationalist, nationalism is probably the biggest thing Bitcoiners would disagree with me. All right, one more question, then we'll close it out. But what do you think is the biggest risk? Hmm. I think the biggest risk to Bitcoin is, that's a very good question. I think the biggest risk to Bitcoin is people being aggressive toward world leaders that want to welcome them, them in with open arms. Um, we've seen this most recently with, and, and in the long term for me, I think it is, it's not a risk that is catastrophic to Bitcoin. Bitcoin won't die if people reject world leaders trying to come on board with them. But for the longest time, we've been so hostile toward uh, world leaders because they've been hostile toward us. Take Elizabeth Warren, for example, my own senator from the great state of Massachusetts. She hates Bitcoin. And so it's kind of in our DNA almost to be very, very skeptical of uh, world leaders because they've always been hostile toward us. When you have leaders of nation states, uh, when you have leading presidential candidates, for example, who are talking about wanting to create the best environment possible for Bitcoin to flourish, I think understanding that no central entity could end or uh, destroy Bitcoin, I think that's only a good thing for us. Um, uh, it, it's only a good thing for us for these people to essentially um, be competing for us, right? Global superpowers aren't competing against us anymore. They're competing for us. So with countries like you know, the United States, for example, now vowing with President Trump to become the most attractive for Bitcoin miners, developers, and users, uh, I think that's only a good thing. Um, I think it's, it's threatening to Bitcoin in the short term, not in the long term. This is not an existential threat to Bitcoin. But I do think it severely impedes our progress if the people who are open advocates for Bitcoin are advocating against uh, the world leaders who are vowing to help us, right? Um, so I do think that that's, uh, that's the biggest conceivable threat for me to Bitcoin now, to be hostile to these world leaders that are openly trying to help us. Because if the United States kicks off a race amongst global superpowers to create the best possible environment for Bitcoin miners, businesses, and users, then uh, that's only a good thing. If we understand Bitcoin as this neutral digital technology that can really never be disrupted, even if there was an EMP that went off, people would still be able to use Bitcoin uh, over radio. If we understand that really nothing can stop this thing, it's only a benefit for world leaders to be competing for our vote and competing to make the best possible environment for us. Um, then uh, when you understand all of that, I think it's, it's a good thing. And it's a bad thing. Skepticism is not a bad thing. But open hostility toward people who are trying to learn and help us out definitely is a bad thing. Yeah. Well, Joe, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down and record this podcast. Where can the audience go learn more about you and maybe what you guys are doing at the Bitcoin? Absolutely. Well, Joe, thanks so much for having me on. I love listening to your podcast, man. It's one of the best. Uh, I've given it a five-star rating on Spotify where I listen to, to it. I'd encourage everyone to leave a rating on the app that you're listening to it on now or give it a like if you're watching on YouTube or X. Uh, you can follow me at Joe Consorti on X, just the way it's spelled in the title, J-O-E-C-O-N-S-O-R-T-I. And you can check us out at the Bitcoin Layer at thebitcoinlayer.com. Um, we have a podcast live on the platform you're listening to this too, and we're also live on YouTube. And we cover Bitcoin through a global macro lens. Uh, we are trying to educate people about Bitcoin who, from any experience level, about how Bitcoin fits into this ever-evolving macro landscape in a universe of other assets uh, so you can follow along with us there uh, at thebitcoinlayer.com and you can follow me on X. Awesome, love it. Well, thank you for your five-star review. Appreciate that. Everyone else, definitely go leave a five-star review if you're li listening. And then off obviously go check out the Bitcoin Layer and probably leave them a five-star review as well. But thanks again, Joe. This is great. Thanks, Joe.